we should pray. Dear God, please give us focus, give us your spirit, give us understanding, and please help us. Amen. Sober-minded gospel action. Let's read some scripture on sobriety. How does scripture speak on the topic of being sober? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 says, Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be, here it is now, sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that be drunken, be drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Smiley face. Notice the vast difference painted in this word picture. Dark, light, night, day. Drunken, sober, sleep, activated. When was that season of life when you were the most alert? What were, what year was it when you were the most sober, most productive, most focused, most fixated on pleasing God and serving others? Way beyond yourself. God wants me to live a sober-minded, ultra-productive, gospel-exploding lifestyle. 100 years from now, all that matters is where we live, with God in heaven or without him in hell. That's a sobering thought. I want you to experience the absolute best possible eternity. Not just graduate into the presence of God, but walk in with streaming colors, magna cum laude, Wow, did you knock it out. That you receive a full reward. That's not possible without being sober. Why do a word study on this simple word? Stay tuned and you'll discover the excellence of meaning that God infused into this small but powerful concept. Let's look at the Bible definition before we look at the English dictionary definition. Then we will blend both definitions together together beautifully. However, we're going to give priority to God's opinion first. Let's unpack this box, shall we? The Bible word definition for sober means to be sound of mind, to be in one's right mind, to be moderate in one's estimation of their self, to think of one soberly. Third definition, to curb one's passions. Such as Titus 2.6 says, Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. So it's a mindset. Now we're going to use scripture use cases to determine the context from the phrasing around the words. Here in 1 Timothy 3, God explains, A bishop then must be vigilant, sober. When you hear vigilant, you mean you see a person with their vision being watchful, and that's a synonym or a close association to sober. It's a qualification of a bishop, a leader. Vigilant, sober. Even so must their wives be grave, sober, faithful in all things. Very positive trait. Titus chapter 2 says that the aged men be sober that they may teach the young women to be sober. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. Old men, young women, young men. Everybody, sober, right? 1 Peter 1, verse 13 says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Skip down to chapter 4, verse 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. 
same book, chapter 5, verse 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. I just want to punch the devil straight in the left nostril every day, one time. That's not possible apart from gospel delivery. For you see, you deliver the gospel, and that's a direct shot to the snot box of your chief adversary. Now blending beautifully the above definition with Webster's 1828. Let's chew on it. Let's focus on handling this one single word for a few moments. Please enjoy. Definition number two, not intoxicated or overpowered by spiritous liquors, the opposite of drunkenness. We're just reading the dictionary. Not mad or insane, not wild or heated with passion, having the regular exercise of a cool, dispassionate, reasoned temper. Next definition. Regular, calm, not under the influence of undue passion, as sober judgment, a man in his sober senses. Next definition, serious, solemn. Will I live today drunk or sober? What's the opposite of sober? That's not me. Does God want me to be sober or not? What is one benefit of a sober lifestyle? Go ahead, please fill in the blank. You can generate one benefit. Just pause to ponder. You got it? What is sober thinking? What is the natural man alternative that opposes my sobriety? Any long-term distraction away from my divine purpose disturbs my sobriety. 2 Corinthians 3, 5, 13 says, For whether we be beside ourselves or whether we be sober, meaning the opposite of a sober person is someone being beside themselves, like operating outside their normal range, outside of their head, crazy level, living almost outside our natural body. It's like we're imagining that we're someone else, like a character in a movie, or we're a first-person immersive 3D video game, pretending I'm not me anymore, which is certainly fun for a while. But it can become an intoxicating escape mechanism to get me away from the real purpose and the function of living what are some natural adversaries to living sober? Entertainment. In moderation, perfectly fine. Not too much too often, though. Surely we are drawn toward binge-watching entire series or long episodes on Prime or Netflix or whatever streaming service. We veg out, right? This is entertainment overload. We unplug from sober living and we experience a state of temporary ecstasy, pretending to live in an alternative reality. What areas of my life do I need to sober up so I can become more useful for God and his gospel? Perhaps education can be an addiction. Education can become a form of intellectual anti-sobriety. I become so heavy in my head that I'm unsteady, inebriated with steady shoveling more and more thoughts into my head that really don't need to be there, over-educated. Scripture defines these people as ever learning and never able to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Notice the ever and the never. It's a loop. Instead, focus on the truth. Truth puts me into action. Truth is unavoidable decision-making. Boom. Make a choice. If it's true, I simply must do something about it. Sober. Not being overly consumed with thrills and exploration. Travel can become a toxin. 
We naturally want to feel a high from going on an adventure, and that's great. Go somewhere, see new things, meet new people. Then we go again. Then we get into a mode of hunting for that burst of feeling. We get doped up on seeking newness. I need to have something new. And then I travel until I see more things and there's no more new things to see. You know, we can talk until there's no more introductions to be made to new people. It's fun to immerse oneself in different cultures. But if you do it too much, the jolt wears off. It's possible to get drunk on vacations. Where are you going? I'm going across the world again and again. Got to chase it down. Got to get away from this place. Got to get outside of the norm, away from the steady rhythm of a sober, productive, steady lifestyle. Break up the monotony, surely. Once in a while, change the scenery. It's healthy for the soul. Go to the mountains. But are we addicted to the thrill of going somewhere besides where we belong? What was the earthly goal of Jesus Christ in the flesh? Was it simply to travel to every country in the world just for fun? To see things? No. He went for his father told him, and he went to help the people. Anyway, sober-minded means don't live life on vacation for one-third of your time. God asks you when you get to heaven, what did you do down there? I saw everything. I just wandered around and I had new experiences all the time. Okay, there's no reward for that. Sober-minded means focused, fixated on what truly matters long-term in the eyes of God. 1 Thessalonians 5 says, Therefore, let us not sleep, but let us watch and be sober. The opposite of sleep is alert. We can get drunk on sleep. Sleep is great and necessary. Unplug from life for a few hours, recharge. Body needs rest. Evidence suggests. Science affirms. Yet we can become drunk on slumber. We can overkill that snooze button, oversleep the morning away. It's possible to become drunk on sloth, slow and floating, unable to complete sentences due to lack of engagement disconnected from the capacity to move one's hands toward the work. I just can't seem to move myself to action today. Kind of slugging it, slow, foggy, laid back, slothful movement, slow of speech, reduced energy on purpose. What's the Bible answer? Awake to righteousness. For now is the source of your salvation, which is Jesus, nearer than when you first believed. His arrival is imminent. He's returning, is getting closer. If every believer in every city produced just one minute of spiritual, gospel-focused content per day, every day, how many days would it take to saturate the world, the whole world, with the knowledge of the gospel? Produce content. Share it. Eventually, everybody hears it. Some will react to this suggestion with, well, I'd be, I'd be kind of embarrassed. I'd be embarrassed not to. You won't be embarrassed in heaven. If you share the gospel, you're not going to be embarrassed before God. You will not be embarrassed before your friends up there. And even my friends who willfully select hell as their final destination will know that they had a true friend on earth who at least cared enough to warn them. Produce gospel content. You know why the vast majority of precious people in this world are currently dying and falling headlong into the bottomless pit of destruction without Christ? Because too many believers are drunk on this world. Too many Christians are consumed with consuming content that does not empower their spiritual walk and their spiritual talk to better tell the world that Jesus saves. Christianity is drunk on the world. We love the things of this world. So we're watching it slide into hell without the gospel. God needs sober soul winners. The Bible says, set your affections on things above, not on the things of earth. Determine the ultimate goal. What is God's goal? I cannot achieve God's goal for my life by avoiding including the gospel. 
Here are some sobering statistics. Death wakes people up. Go to a funeral. Face your mortality. It'll make you think about the gospel. Go three generations max into the future. My kids, my grandkids, great-grandkids, three generations. And the memory of you and all you did becomes nearly meaningless. No one past your great-grandkids, that third generation out, will think about you for even one second per day. Evidence? How often do you think about your great-great-grandpa? Zero. You have, therefore, three generations max to matter. That's it. Done. Makes you think about doing something that will endure and outlast you as an eternal legacy. You will have zero eternal legacy apart from helping people discover eternal life in Christ through the gospel. And they can be your eternal friends. Next statistic. According to scripture, life is a vapor. Your life is a waft in the wind, a slight puff of smoke, a blip on the screen, which appeareth for a short time and then vanisheth away. It's over and you enter eternity. Number next one, eternity is everything. Eternity is our sobering target. There is no awesome eternity apart from active gospel participation. God expects you to do something with the gospel. Not doing that specific something will disappoint God. Our greatest fear should not be our greatest fear should be not fulfilling our God-given purpose. So we want to establish a sober spiritual mindset. How do we do this? How do we motivate ourselves? How do we set a short code for deep, massive action? How do I move myself to become sober? When I was in high school, a couple words resonated so completely and so deeply that I was moved to maximum effort. In fact, I was moved beyond my natural human capacity for production. One word was state. You know a high school student who's fixated on their em- their athletic career. I locked in this concept of state. S-T-A-T-E, state. And I became extremely sober-minded, fixated, laser-tight, long-range future vision focused on winning a state title. The current workload became light and easy because I was doing things based on a mutually agreed upon goal that was set in mind that I was going to accomplish. So to activate this illustration personally, let's write down one word that will keep your mind fixed on the gospel. Another word that motivated me way back in high school when I was fully sober was the name of my nemesis, Aaron Craig. I defined that adversary. He was the person I had to beat to become the state champion. Know your opposition. Train harder than he does. If you have zero resistance, you are doing zero. I have demons hunting me down, attempting to assassinate my potential, derailing my God-given ministry opportunities in my near future, there is strong demonic opposition, a war going on in my head. Define your adversary. The next thing I wrote down and something I said consistently in high school was, I could take you down. Now in the sport I was in, the goal was to simply take someone down. One action possible. Believe you can do something. I can breathe. I can think. I can pray. I can read. I can trust God. I can express gratitude. I can do that one thing the devil does not want. I can promote the gospel. I can encourage others to share 
truth. I can ask God to give me worthy content for distribution consistently. Dear God, use me. Funnel flow through me. Find one action and make it happen. Number next, realize Satan hates gospel. Satan hates gospel. These are very short because they're simply designed to move you. Know your enemy. Know what your enemy hates. If you don't know what's good, at least you should know the general opposite direction of evil is good. If I know what evil wants, I know what evil hates. And so I do that which opposes evil. The devil hates Christians winning. The devil hates Jesus. The devil hates his children leaving his house, divorcing him, abandoning their hellish home, and converting by faith to new birth, to their new home, to their new heavenly father. The devil hates that. He hates losing. So we should be gospel winning. Here's another two words I wrote down that might motivate us to be sober-minded. Life everlasting. Write that on your vision board. Life everlasting. What are you doing today? I'm focusing on life everlasting. This is the solution. Focus on the outcome. Work is outcomes. You will do the work if you see the outcome. If you're going to participate in any endeavor, you should know the definition of what success looks like. Here in the Christian walk, success is simply introducing people to eternal life. And then determine a long-term decade of dedication. If you're going to do anything worthwhile in this life, you must devote at least one decade to reach maximum success. You're going to be in that sport? Do it for a decade. If you're going to participate in the gospel, do it for a decade. Minimum. What is one singular action you promise God and you commit to yourself to do every working day for a decade? How about this? Produce gospel content. Shorts, reels, texts, videos, podcasts, sermons, something, verses. Share it, tell it. Let's win the world to Jesus.